Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Today we're talking about America's next revolution and whether we are on the brink of it. Uh, ransacked by COVID. are Harry Anastasio, Professor of International Peace and Conflict Studies at Portland State University, David Madland, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress, Stephen Schlesinger, Fellow at the Center Century Foundation, Bill Baroni, a former New Jersey State Senator and former executive at the New York and New Jersey Port Authority, and Tanvir Kothawala, founder at Pioneer 1890. We're gonna start by um, giving each of our panelists a specific question tailored to their expertise. And then after we get through all the questions, I'm hoping some of the panelists will weigh in on uh, the responses that their co-panelists gave. But I wanna start with Harry, Harry Anastasio from Portland State University. Harry, just 21. descended on the Capitol grounds, with at least hundreds making it inside the Capitol while lawmakers were also inside. Five people died and over a hundred more were injured. As an expert in conflict analysis and peace building, I'm wondering what was going through your head uh, on January 6th, and do you have thoughts on how we can bridge the political divisiveness that led to that upbringing? Okay, thank you, Abby, for the question. I see at least five questions uh, in the issues that you posed. Uh, but starting with the first uh, comment that you made, that 2021 uh, will see a reduction in polarization, I don't see that at all. Uh, in fact, I see uh, more uh, polarization, more toxicity in politics. And the high point, of course, of that toxicity is the fact that for the first time in the history of the United States, we had a presidential election where the political leadership and a huge portion of the constituency are divided as to its legitimacy. Never before did we have polarized politics reach that level of ambiguity. And the issue here is that 2020 essentially disclosed a lot of the fault lines uh, that pre-existed uh, for a long time and some perhaps over the last 15 years. Uh, it exposed the fault lines on many levels. And I just want to mention a few, because I think 2020 is an exemplary year because of the confluence of mainly three factors. We had the impact of the pandemic. We had the rise of populist nationalism, especially with the advent of the Trump administration. And we also had presidential elections. The confluence of these factors created a kind of perfect storm that pulled the curtain back and disclosed all the fault lines within uh, American society that became exceedingly toxic uh, to the present day. Uh, I will simply mention a few, um, starting with the economic aspect. Uh, we know that over the last uh, couple of decades, the, the top 1% of the country, the richest people got richer, the middle class remained relatively stagnant. And according to official statistics, 34 million Americans live in poverty. Um, there was also a, an account from uh, the New York Times a few years ago where it stated from official statistics that 1%, the richest 1% of America, now own more wealth than the bottom 90%. This is staggering. And a more recent statistic that came from bank data, uh, which came up in the middle of the pandemic with the economy at a standstill, it stated that 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings. Not to mention the disproportionate impact that the pandemic had and the economy had on people of color. So. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because the people who feel disenfranchised or left behind 
uh, are a huge pool of citizens that are quite susceptible to extremist responses and quite susceptible to extremist ideologies. And I think a lot of people who feel disenfranchised have been pulled in different directions, some on the ex extreme left, some on the extreme right, in response to the grievances, which are real, they are not imaginary. But the, the challenge we have is that the more extreme the problems become, the more extreme the ideologies become that spin out of them. And we have had that throughout uh, 2020. Uh, there have also been uh, certain triggers that created the tumultuous events of 2020. Uh, these were essentially the killing of George Floyd uh, by the police, which became a kind of national and global icon of, of uh, racial injustice. We had protests and counter protests by both sides of the political divide. Some were peaceful, but some were violent on both sides again. Uh, we had constant social unrest throughout 2020, and it was so serious that nearly all 50 states activated their National Guard. And then we had the clash of ideologies that became very, very explicit. I don't know if I have time to go into this, but maybe I should pause and then return later. Uh, your, your, uh, your judgment call, uh, Abby? You have, you have a couple more minutes. You okay. want to go ahead? So I think the, the clash of ideologies uh, was disclosed early on with the approach of the different uh, sides of the political divide in regard to the pandemic. Uh, one side prioritized the science and mitigating measures, whereas the other side, the Trump side, prioritized uh, the restarting of the economy. Uh, and they saw each other as threats. The, the, the camp on Trump's side saw the emphasis on mitigating the pandemic as being a violation of individual freedom, uh, whereas the uh, side that uh, supported the mitigating measures saw the other side as uh, violating uh, truth and science. Uh, and this uh, deepened the polarization. Then we had uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, uh, which uh, originally started as a as a peaceful uh, organization to address you know racial issues and issues of racial justice, uh, along with uh, BLM also came Antifa, which is a, a violent far left nationalist uh, movement uh, tinted uh, BLM by their presence. They were the group that tended to be more violent. And on the other side, uh, the Trump side, uh, they actually stigmatize uh, BLM uh, through the lenses of Antifa as uh, being far left and being terrorists. And the emphasis on the Trump side was law and order, by force if necessary, uh, and the emphasis on uh, the side of BLM and Democrats was on racial justice. So we have complete polarization around the very same events. Uh, a similar polarization we see in regard to the role of the police. Uh, BLM advocated the reform and defunding the police. Uh, the, uh, the Trump camp advocated for uh, more reinforcing the police and um, supporting the police over against the uh, BLM movement, which uh, it characterized as uh, you know, a hooligan movement uh, and a looting movement, basically, uh, while not paying any attention to the grievances as to whether the grievances were credible or not. So we had another pol polarization there. Uh, the, the Trump side also managed to use the most extreme positions the Democrat side was viewed from the lens of Antifa uh, and the constituency essentially adopted that view. Uh, you also have extremities on the left where 
the image they projected of Republicans, uh, especially under the leadership of Trump, is that they're all racist, they're all fascist, and they're all authoritarian, uh, which created a huge backlash accusing the left of being racist because they talk about you know white privilege and accuse the whites of all sorts of things that are unacceptable to them. So what I am describing right now is not what I think is true or false. I'm describing a dynamic that has deeply polarized America that has not been addressed. Why? Because each side is preoccupied with its own narrative, assuming that its own narrative is correct. This is why I think the polarization in America today has gone beyond uh, truth and falsehood. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the strategies, uh, especially on the Trump side, you discover that the strategic approach is one of raw power and, and raw toughness. You know, if you can be as tough as possible with your opponents, that's what counts. And being tough with your opponents to the extreme is more important than both truth or falsity. Whatever adds to that raw power of opposition is what you do. And we have seen this cut through the fabric of politics uh, in America today. Um, we also saw uh, the culture war. The culture war has been around for a long time, but it, was op it operated within certain tolerable limits. Now the culture war in 2020 has reached the highest level of political culture in America. Uh, what we saw, especially with the, the battle over statute, we saw a kind of uh, a return to history and to historiography. Uh, we saw this rivalry as to how America's history is to be recorded and conveyed. And essentially, we had two camps. We had the what I call the nationalist right wing, which interpreted the history of America as being one of uh, grandeur and glory and whiteness. And on the other hand, we had the more critical perspective of America, where the extremity was to see America as having a history of banality, oppression, and bias. Both of these are extremities, but they want, they want the narrative. The conflict along these axes of extremities entered the mainstream which brings us also to the role of the media. The media have also been polarized in America. You can take all the media and all the social platforms and you can place them pretty accurately as to which side of the political divide they tend to lean. But especially the social media, the social media did huge harm to America's divisiveness. Why? Because of the algorithms they use. Essentially, when you are on social media and you select what you want to see and what you want to read, the algorithms that work in the backdrop send you more of the same, more of the same, more of the same. Now, that, that is fine when you are doing a search for shoes. <laughs> they send you more shoes. But if you are talking about ideological perspectives that define behavior, that define policy, that interpret reality for you. That can be very dangerous. Uh, the, and more and more people get their news from social media, they interact through social media. So we have come to a point where each side of the political divide lives in a different world. I would even go as far as to say they live in a different country. That's how deep the division has gone. If we have time later on, we can do some deconstruction of the ideologies. Uh, but a very significant shift that has taken place because of what I just shared is the fact that some of the extreme fringe groups uh, that existed at the fringes of American society, because of this dynamic, they were brought into the mainstream. I'm talking about Antifa and its affiliates on the one side. I'm talking about the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo, the Three Percenter, QAnon on the other side. And they are all armed. And this brings us to another rather dangerous dimension of the American divide. And that is guns, the gun culture. This dynamic has really deepened and expanded the gun culture of America. 
Uh, for example, gun sales went up 95% during the first six months of 2020. 58% among African Americans who feel unsafe in relation to the police. When these groups begin to turn to arms and the country is deeply divided, mainly down the middle, we are beyond the realm of uh, criminality. We are talking about a, civil, uh, a civic polarization by armed citizens. And that- Here, can I, give you I think we need to-, to. To wrap up so that we can go to the next one? Yes, of course. I will stop. I was volunteered to stop. But <laughs> you <ask me laughs> Thank you so much. But we can go back to some of those issues. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, and I'm sure we will um, with the various other panelists. David, I'm hoping that you can talk about one of the other crises that was playing out um, amid all of the protests and the election, which is obviously the, the pandemic that has so far claimed over 500,000 American lives and wreaked havoc on our global economic situation as well. The suffering caused by the health and the economic stressors has disproportionately impacted the most vulnerable Americans. Uh, the low-income populations, and specifically Black and Hispanic populations, uh, these people were more likely to lose their jobs due um, to COVID. They were also more likely to get sick from COVID and more likely to die from COVID. Uh, but meanwhile, between March and December of 2020, America's 614 billionaires grew their net worth by over 931 collective billion. Um, as a senior fellow with expertise on economic inequality and labor, what should the government or other parties be doing to address these inequities? Thank you, Abby. Appreciate it. So I think there's a lot that uh, policymakers can do to address the uh, huge economic divides in our country, as well as the racial and gender gaps. And I think it's going to be it's important, not just for those who aren't doing as well as those at the very top, but as you know, Harry alluded to in his early comments, any economic inequality is one of the big polarizing factors in our society, and it, it contributes to the really weak, uh, decaying democracy in the United States right now. So it's 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 crucial we address um, the staggering levels of inequality we have, and I think there, the ways we can do that through policies we can think about policies that raise wages, things like raise the minimum wage increase access to overtime or run a really tight economy as the stimulus, the recovery act that was just passed is going to help try to do. We can also, um, and, and the raising wages, especially for those at the, at the bottom, I think would be key. We can enforce workplace laws a lot better than we currently do. Estimates are that, you know, around two thirds of low wage workers are a victim of some sort of wage theft, meaning they didn't get paid what they were legally owed we can um, boost education and training to make it less expensive, more accessible, and better connected to good quality jobs. We can do a lot of things that will reduce uh, the incomes, the share of income going to the very, very top. And that are, includes things like raising taxes on uh, incomes, raising capital gains taxes, even taxing wealth. It also means better enforcing our antitrust policies so that we don't have such dominant monopolies, uh, making it harder for small businesses to compete and siphoning off most of the profits of, of an industry. Um, we can do a lot more to help the needy, raise SNAP benefits, unemployment insurance, even direct stimulus cash kind of payments. The and sort of all of these policies I've been talking about, in some ways, I think you can think of them as kind of a progressive universalism in that they are just policies designed to help everyone. But the biggest beneficiaries are going to be those at the bottom um, of the income spectrum. And I think we need to do a lot of them. We also need to do more targeted um, focused policies to really, for example, you know, address gender gaps. We can improve pay transparency. We can collect pay data um, and race a huge race wealth gaps, you know, where uh, blacks have one tenth the wealth of whites. We can um, improve our anti-discrimination enforcement and even do things like baby bonds. Uh, now, 
but the sort of two last policies I want to hit on, I in some ways think are uh, perhaps the most important to addressing inequality. And one is reforms to make our democracy work better. It is absolutely the case that the wealthy elite have too much influence on our democracy in part because we have allowed money to freely flow, that the wealthy have way too much influence. So we can limit that. We can uh, improve access to voting. We can reduce gerrymandering, filibuster, all these sort of anti-democratic That's crucial because unions help raise wages, reduce inequality, but they also give ordinary citizens a powerful voice in democracy. They help uh, people participate more and ensure that their voices are heard. It's sort of the behind the scenes activities. And, you know, the last thing I want to leave with is, so I've rattled off a long list of, of policies, but I want to highlight there is a lot to do, but also there are in some ways, there's a reason for optimism. There's a bleak time in, in American history, but there's some reason for optimism that policies really do matter. They can affect the shape of the economy and the shape of inequality. You know, some will claim there's nothing we can do, that the period of the 1950s, 60s, 70s was an aberration. We can never go back to sort of levels of inequality. There are levels of equality we achieved there. Um, I also think, I think, you know, if you can even look back to the U.S., in the progressive era, the late, er, the late 19 teens and early 20s, we significantly reduced inequality in that period. And then when we reversed policies in the late 20s, inequality increased. And so we have a number of examples just in U.S. history where we've been able to achieve it and show that policy matters and it shapes the economic distribution in a significant way. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I want to hop over to uh, Bill Baroni, who is a former state senator from New Jersey, um, also a former executive at the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. And I, I feel like his um, his response might differ a little bit from David's. So which is why I wanted to call on him next. Um, but he spent several months in prison for a crime that the U.S. Supreme Court later acquitted him of. Um, as a state senator, he voted in favor of mandatory minimum sentencing. But his time as a federal inmate has changed his perception of how uh, the U.S. criminal justice system, which incarcerates more of a percent of its uh, population than any other country, operates. Um, you know, Bill, I'd venture that the overwhelming majority of policymakers don't spend time behind bars themselves. I also uh, doubt that many of them know many people in uh, the criminal justice system. And so now that you've experienced both sides of the coin, both the, the policy making on criminal justice as well as the lived experience of it, I'm wondering, you know, what would you recommend that policymakers do to um, improve our policies? Because, you know, COVID has also really shined a light on um, how incarceration is negatively impacting communities and, and the people um, in those communities. And also, what would a less punitive criminal justice system look like, both uh, in terms of how it would affect the economy and how it would affect the people who um, have been behind bars for a long time for nonviolent crimes? Thanks. Well, Abby, thank you very much. And, and I want to th thank my fellow panelists uh, for uh, spending some time this afternoon. Um, you know, when I started in politics, when I first ran for the legislature, I was just out of law school. And I ran as a Republican, and I was a very moderate Republican back when that's such such an entity in the prehistoric times when such an entity could actually still exist. And I, rep I ran for office against an incumbent in a very Democratic district. President Obama later carried my district. David, to your point about redistricting, my district was almost 70 percent Democratic. And I won. I locked on a lot of doors. And But when I was in office, you know, every year one of the newspapers or something would, would, would talk about how... I, I was amongst the group that was the most bipartisan members of the legislature. You know, I would vote for, you know, I voted as a Republican, I voted for a minimum, to your point, David, I voted for the minimum wage increase. I voted for marriage equality. I voted for um, medical marijuana at a time where Repu this was in the, you know, the mid 2000s where Republic, this was not a Republic. But at the time I would run for office and I'd run for reelection. 
And being bipartisan was seen as a strength. Like we would run commercials talking about, isn't it great that, you know, the bill's bipartisan and he's independent and he votes on issues. Because when I went to the 20 something thousand doors I knocked down in my career, very few people ever said to me, make sure you go to the state house and only vote the party line. You know, that's not what people would say to me when I would campaign. People would always say, well, I vote the person. I vote for the woman or the man, not the party. I heard this over and admittedly, I was from a blue collar so what we would, I guess, a Roosevelt Reagan district, right? And so I was reelected by bigger and bigger margins, and bipartisanship then was in my last election for the for the Senate was two thousand seven. That was considered a good thing. That would not be the case today. Like people would not run commercials today and say, "I'm independent. I'm super bipartisan. I work across party lines." Um, and I remember a true story, Abby, and I, I promise I won't belabor the story. And I, it is that. I remember one time the state was in a budget shutdown or something, and the Democratic speaker of the legislature didn't agree with the Democratic governors. They shut the state down of the budget. And I remember we were just sort of perpetually in session. So nothing was actually happening. I was sitting and I had a very, very good friend who went on to the state Senate with me and a very good person. And we, I just went and sat next to him on the Democratic side of the aisle. And I had a young Republican staffer come over to me and tell me that I shouldn't be sitting with a Democrat. That the To, to, that we now view it as a bad thing to be considered bipartisan. But we do have an example in the most recent four years where bipartisanship actually worked and actually went to, Abby, some of the, the factors that you laid out. You know, if we think back on the four years of the Trump administration, the one piece of legislation, and there, I'm, not, I'm sure there's post office and lots of legislation that was bipartisan, but the one major policy piece of legislation that genuinely attracted people that normally would never be seen on the same piece of legislation was criminal justice reform. And the small but important First Step Act, where you had people, where you, you, know, you had people on the, the considered on the political left and people considered on the, you know, people like Cory Booker my senator from New Jersey and Ted Cruz, right? Agreeing and Tom, you know, agreeing on criminal justice reform. And that is an example where I st still believe that bipartisanship can happen if we focus on outcomes. And what we saw with the First Step Act, and, and the First Step Act passed in December of 2019. And I went in uh, to Loretto Federal Prison in March. Talk about a phrase I never expected to say in my career. I went into federal prison in March of 2000 and 2019, uh, April of 2019. I was supposed to spend 18 months. The Supreme Court took my case, later overturned it, so I was released early. But the three months that I spent there were really just after the, the, the signing of the First Step Act. And my fellow inmates in the prison that I was in in Western Pennsylvania, the First Step Act was something that even in its introduction began to hit, David, your great points about reducing inequality. There were people who I was in prison with who had been sentenced under the previous crack powder cocaine differential that the bipartisan First Step Act fixed. And were remo I remember one guy on a Sunday afternoon at five o'clock, they came and got him to send him home because he was now over his sentence. Right. So if you want to reduce inequality. This is where bipartisanship worked. Another example, increasing educational outcomes of people who are in the prison system. Benefits for taking classes that's starting now to work its way through the federal prison system. And states have really led this around the country. What's that? What that's doing is giving an example where if you incentivize people in federal prison to take classes, whether those classes are adult continuing education classes, you know, I taught GED classes. Um, and you're seeing outcomes that are benefiting people across the spectrum. So that's reducing inequality. Um, even the First Step Act and the CARES Act, the initial Trump Congress bill on COVID that created a situation where thousands of federal inmates, nonviolent federal inmates, were released to home confinement. And what we're seeing is those people are not recidivizing or whatever, you know, they're not committing these crimes again, proving the point that we are over sentencing. Right, that people don't need to be necessarily incarcerated for as long as people are because they're getting out and they're not repeating their crimes. 
And I, I bring up the first step back because, A, it affected so many people across the spectrum. It affected people across the income spectrum. It affected families. One third of people across the country have relative or close family friends who are in the criminal justice system. But it proved the point, the reason, reason I bring it up is that if policymakers are willing to actually realize that it's OK to work with people at the other end of the political spectrum, you actually can make a difference in the political spectrum, right? Not everybody I was in Loretto prison were, were, were Democrats. Not everybody I was in with Loretto were Republicans. And I think if we look at the model where you have true extremes on the political spectrum, and I can tell you, and, and, and Abby, thank you for pointing this out. I, when I was in the legislature, one of the things that people say, well, he was a re Republican on criminal justice issues. I voted for mandatory sentence. I then go in through this process and trust me, I'm not saying you all need to go through the process of going to prison to become wise on these issues just to take my word for it. Um, but I learned that this system isn't working, right? But what we're seeing is the fix to that system. And the fix, David, to your point about income equality, Harry, to your point about the differing views, the answer to the problem, we've done it. And, but it's not like we did it 40 years ago. We did it three years ago. It can be done in a highly polarized environment on an issue. It's not like naming a post office on an issue that genuinely drives people to the polls, the op polar opposites. And I think that the, the, the first step back model of legislation of bringing people on true opposite ends of points and bringing them together, it can. And I'm not saying it will. And Harry, I think you made some great points. It can be a model in this post Bipartisanship. The bipartisanship was good 15 years ago, well, it's not today. By the way, whenever I hear sirens, I get a little nervous. So just. <laughs> I think that's a great jumping off point to go to Stephen, you know, and, and, and thank you, Bill. I think you made a lot of great points. There have been improvements in the criminal justice system. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to do. You know, we've seen a lot of police. Um, shootings. Uh, we still have issues where uh, people leave prison or acquitted of crimes and still can't get jobs because they, it shows that they they have um, run-ins with the criminal justice system on their in their personal histories. Um, you know, just last night or yesterday, we saw that um, uh, the police officer who said that the accused shooter in Atlanta had said. Um, you know, this guy was just having a really bad day that that same uh, police officer had some uh, had posted a racist T-shirt on um, his Facebook. But, you know, in in all of those things, which have led to a lot of the political strife that we see going on right now. Um, Stephen, you're an expert on chaos and an author of one book on the formation of the U.N. after the turbulence of World War Two and another book on the 1954 uh, CIA sponsored coup in Guatemala. So the, the crises at the center of those two books are obviously a lot different than the crises we're experiencing right now. You know, a, a, a pandemic and general political divisiveness and debates over um, police brutality. Those things are different than a world war and a government overthrow. But I'm wondering whether there are some similarities but th that you see in our current political divisions that you also saw maybe back in World War II um, or uh, as, the, as the coup in Guatemala was, was happening. And as someone who has studied some major rebuildings, have, have the things that we've experienced over the course of the last year, can they help us get to a better, more uh, peaceful place? Okay, well, thank you. I, I will be addressing this issue from a rather different angle than the other speakers. I, I have written those two books, and I, let me just briefly talk about them, because one of the common themes in, in these two books is the issue of economic inequality and, and the need for equity in, in economic outcomes. Um, the book on the Guatemalan coup, I don't know how many people here knew, but back in 1954, the Eisenhower administration overthrew through the CIA a democratically elected government in Guatemala. Now, why why did that happen? Well, um, Guatemala had a history of, of uh, vast in inequality in wealth. About 2% of the families in Guatemala owned about 80% of the assets of the country. And one of the biggest firms, in fact, the biggest corporation in, in Guatemala was was a Boston-based company called the United Fruit Company. And uh, the man who was in 
president had been elected in a democratic uh, elected government in 1950, a man named Jacobo Arbenz, had come in on the theory that he had to do something about this vast gap between the rich and the poor in order to, to create a society which would be sustainable in the future. And one of his first acts was to uh, institute an agrarian reform uh, measure, which basically took away some of the land that the United Fruit had in, in its possession. The United Fruit was the biggest landowner in the country. They had lots of extra land that they never used on the theory that they might need it in the future, but they that future never came, so the land lay fallow. He, uh, he, he had the Congress, which had also been democratically elected to to um, support this agrarian reform and and the um, it, the the land the, there was a compensation program so that the United Fruit would be, be repaid for the land that it would be losing. Unfortunately for uh, our bands, the uh, United Fruit Company had very close ties to both the Eisenhower administration and and to the CIA, and they eventually convinced the CIA with Eisenhower's blessing to overthrow this government in order to stop the uh, agrarian reform program going forward. And, and this uh, ended in, in, a in the collapse of the Arbenz regime and, for the, uh, and the takeover by a dictator named Castillo Armos. And for the next 20 to 30 years, Guatemala was run by a series of military dictators. And United Fruit got back its land and uh, the gap in wealth never changed for all that uh, two to three uh, or so decades. And even today, Guatemala is uh, a flailing, if illiberal state. It does have f so-called free elections, but they're not really as free as m a lot of people would like to see them. And the issue of, of wealth distribution has never been resolved. So there there is a, a country which face economic inequality and it's it's it, it actually uh, made the the country even worse off because of the outside intervention by the US and also by the fact that uh, these military dictatorships had had dominated the country for so many decades now we switch to the United Nations the United Nations one of the main reasons the United Nations was created uh, in 1945 is that after two world wars in which uh, collectively about 90 million people died, 30 million in World War One, 60 million or so in World War Two, was to stop, to stamp out the possibility of further conflict. The delegates who came to San Francisco could not abide the notion that they, there would be a third world war. And they all agreed that they had to have this central security body um, operate in a way that would head off conflicts and create the conditions for peace around the world. But there was a secondary aspect to the United Nations. The, United, the delegates said that you don't have these kind of conflicts without having some economic uh, disability which starts them. In other words, terrible economic situations create the conditions for takeovers or coups or for uh, uh, murderous regimes as the fight for wealth and the fight for society of control goes on. So when the UN set up the Security Council, which is basically to deal with the issues of peace and war, they also set up a companion council called the Economic and Social Council, which was designed to deal with economic inequality around the world. And by economic equality, that meant basically trying to aim development towards those countries which are very poor and have never had a chance to kind of had normal societal development in their in their own um, internal dynamics and so ECOSOC which is the uh, so short name for the Economic and Social Council Sorry, it, I just want to um, pipe up to say about one minute if you could wrap up so we okay. can thanks. anyway um, what I'm leading to is the fact that um, Today, we have the same kind of economic uh, inequality in this country, and we've been talking about it, Harry and, and, and uh, David and, and, and Bill have all kind of alluded to this issue. Uh, one of the problems has been that because of this uh, polarization, 
during many of the times that the Democrats, who tend to be the more socially liberal of the, of the two co parties, have tried to introduce jobs programs and so on, the, go the Republicans tend to say, well, we don't believe in that. We don't believe in government. We don't think government should be big. And therefore, they've blocked all the kind of job programs and and infrastructure programs that the Democrats have tried to, to pass. And therefore, they validated the notion that government is inefficient and can't work. And I think one of the reasons that Biden has suddenly been successful with this program that he just passed is that he's showing that government, activist government can work. That in fact, if you allow the past possibility of these legislative initiatives to pass, we will see a new kind of development in this country. So my point is that I, I think that activist government has never really been given a good chance over the last 50 or 60 years to show that it can do things. And so we're about to find out in the, in the, in the coming years whether in fact it will work or not. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so Tanvir, you are a partner at a venture capital firm. You're also uh, the founder of an investment and advisory firm. Um, and the former executive at a, a company that uses satellites to monitor issues like geopolitical conflict. All of these companies have played a role or aim to play a role in solving issues on behalf of governments. I'm wondering if you can share a strong example of one of these companies uh, doing something that protected uh, the United States. And also with growing political rest in the United States, why should we trust non-governmental groups to keep us safe? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's it's a lot of people are probably wondering why is a venture capitalist on a political trust and democracy panel? But I say I actually, uh, Bill and I actually went to the same undergraduate alma mater, and I also got affected by the political bug. Um, but I, you know, the way I took it, I spent my early years, a lot of late, early late high school years in, in in Paris, France, and I used when I used to walk to school, I used to see all these monuments to American soldiers had done to help the French in World War II and World War I. And when I kind of looked at my, when I got back to when I was in college and, and started my career, and I looked back at all the things that government, you know, the things that, you know, America, government, the things we remember what America could do, the landing man on the moon, winning World War II, doing all these things. I, I saw in my lifetime, we, Hurricane Katrina happened, then the financial crisis happened, and now we're suffering from this COVID disaster. And the idea of that is we want government, we want, like, I think what um, Mr. Schlesinger said, we want government to be effective. We want it to, you know, we want it to solve our problems. It's our shared project together. And I've seen the growing delta of how, how, how sclerotic government is to how effective, how kind of intractable problems need to be. And I think the private sector offers a, a kind of this unique way, you know, back in World War II, um, you know, in 1940, America's military was like 15th in the world. Portugal was 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 a bigger military force than we were, right? And because America didn't have, you know, as as we entered the war, we didn't we weren't saddled by the infrastructure of trench warfare. We were able to leapfrog a lot of other countries and, and win World War II because we were innovative. You know, Henry Ford partnered up with the Defense Department to make more airplanes than ever thought was humanly possible. So when 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 they were when we reduced the silosization between government and the private sector, magical things can happen. And that's what we're trying to do at Pioneer 1890, working with a disinformation company that worked with um, battleground states in the U.S. election and, department, and the Department of Homeland Security to help monitor foreign interference and like just misinformation about the election. Like everything where like people were going to request a mail-in ballot because there was a rumor on social media that someone had been put, laced anthrax into mail-in ballot schemes, right? We, we the, you know, government has to carry these very, has constitutionally mandated missions to carry it out, but we live in a world where technology is going faster and faster, and we got to give government the best tools to carry out its mission, because if we can give government the best tools to carry out its missions and show that it's effective, people will trust the system, and institutional trust is at a record low, uh, and, and and that's the hope, is is the you know, I, I like to think in a very romantic notion, the venture industry exists to realize opportunity that the status quo either fails to recognize or ignores. And, and that's where we can succeed. And I think, you know, if I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about their COVID vaccines, a lot of the does that rollout has been a disaster. It's because there hasn't really been a good, effective partnership between the private sector and government. And, and we've kind of duplicated things, systems that don't need to be duplicated. And so if, if we can kind of reduce this 
this barrier between and, and create a true frictionless partnership. We, we can actually create an effective government that can be that can be legislated effectively by politicians who decide these decisions, like people like people like uh, people like Bill. And I think that we will we will reduce polarization because people will feel like their voices are heard and they don't have to move to the extreme to feel like the system can be responsive to their needs. Thank you. Um, so it seems like we still have a couple people in the room. Um, I'm really grateful that all of you were able to um, uh, contribute such thoughtful responses to my questions. And I also want to give you guys an opportunity to respond. Um, if anybody has a thought on what, what a co-panelist said, feel free to do so now. Yes, just a couple of comments. First of all, a big thank you to the panelists. I think we come from very different walks of life. And I think the fact that we are together on this panel 